Uh, welcome to the uh, first pitch night um, where we're going to uh, for uh, for Rebel One, uh, where we're covering inequality startups. Uh, and and thank you very much for joining us tonight. I'm gonna uh, pass it over and do a, a quick um, introduction um, on on Rebel One. Um, and uh, oh, sorry about that. Getting our so uh, our, our pitch night on zero inequality, we're, we're uh, extremely excited to highlight uh, startups and founders that, that are working to uh, advance the space. Um, but, uh, but before, and, and I'll also introduce uh, Rebel One Ventures. So uh, we're uh, a, a, an investor community. Uh, so we syndicate deals into um, for-profit impact startups uh, that are moving, uh, addressing our zero goals. So zero inequality, and we focus uh, on uh, education, future of work, uh, and also uh, fintech solutions, among other zero goals. Um, a, a little bit more, uh, bef uh, but before we do uh, introductions, we want you all to meet one another. So we're going to do a quick uh, icebreaker session where we're going to, uh, you know, break out into groups of two or three, so that you guys can answer a question. So introduce your name and share how would you spend a million dollars. And I know there are founders in the audience. Um, Talk about how would you spend a million dollars if you had all the money you needed for your startup, uh, an extra an extra million um, per se. So let's do, um, we're gonna shift right now um, into, into those breakout rooms. Um, and again, it's how would you spend uh, a million dollars? Um, so go into the breakout rooms, we'll do it for two or three minutes, uh, meet a few people, and then uh, we'll do that one more time and we'll come back. Great, we have a few people joining um, us right now. We just kicked off. We're doing a quick networking session where we're going into uh, breakout rooms to talk about uh, pe people are, are, are meeting each other and we're talking about how we would spend a million dollars uh, beyond uh, spending money on our startup. So hopefully you've, uh, you've had a chance to um, go into your breakout rooms. For those that are online and just waiting, um, join the breakout room and, and feel free to meet someone <clears throat> in the audience. And we'll come right back in a moment. All right, so we had a few latecomers on the line. We're in a quick breakout session. People are talking about how they would spend a million dollars. We're uh, coming back in a moment. That's good. I'm, I'm good. That'll help yeah. motivate them. I, I wouldn't push on it if I didn't think that there was an opportunity cost. To okay. Play. All right, everyone. Thanks for joining. We're going to do one more quick session. So for those of you have, that have just joined, uh, we have uh, the other participants will join us in about 30 seconds, um, but we're going to do uh, another quick session so you can meet other people in the virtual audience. Um, so please join the, the breakout room. You'll meet two or three others, so share your name. And uh, the, the next uh, icebreaker question is, what is your superpower? Then we'll dive into to the pitch night. 
um, itself. All right, I think we have everyone. Yep, everyone just came back. So um, thanks everyone. We're gonna do a quick, uh, the, the, the next question um, is what is your superpower? Uh, so so we're, we're going to split back into groups of two or three. Um, please join the breakout room so you have uh, the opportunity to meet some of the people that are, are supporting, uh, whether you're an investor or founder, uh, and uh, share um, in the icebreaker. No, it's a little, you know, uh, 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 maybe a little nuanced, a little new, but, um, but take the opportunity to do that and we'll come back in a moment. The question is, what is your superpower? All right, we have a few people here. Dorleans, what's your superpower? Hey, what's going on, Sergio? Superpower. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, sorry, my brother just called. I was in the middle of <laughs> I'm like, hey, I'm in the middle of a meeting. I'll call you back. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, I'd have to say patience. <laughs> patience. All right, there we go. Yeah. Aurelia, how about you? Arella? Is hey. it yep. So what's your superpower? Um I would say I I can eat more than you would think. <laughs> I love that. That's great. Great. Who else wants to share? I would say I I, I like structuring chaos uh, and making things. That's mine. <laughs> Making things quickly. All right, great. We're going to close the rooms and we'll come back. We have more and more people joining us. Great. So that's a good. So everyone's going to join us in about 30 seconds. Kara, what's your superpower? That's a great question. I think I need to think about that for a few minutes. <laughs> um, I'm really good at ordering pizza for large groups of people and getting the accurate number of pizzas. I mean that's that that's that's a that's a talented thing. Uh, yeah. That is a great. So I think we're great. Everyone's back now. So um, now I'll I'll give a quick introduction um, before turning it over to Buki. My name is Sergio Marrero. I am uh, the managing partner uh, with Rebel One. Uh, and uh, my background, um, I uh, originally started my, my career, focused on industrial engineering at Northeastern University, uh, went off to, to Deloitte Consulting, uh, and, and then um, jumped into the startup realm with a focus on, on ed tech, worked to Teach for America, uh, and, um, and then went to the Harvard Business School and the Kennedy School of Government, focused on impact innovation, uh, and um, did my thesis on startup studios. Uh, and uh, ended up uh, starting a few ed tech startups, some of them that blew up, but uh, but didn't give up and, and uh, ended up um, working at a venture capital fund, which um, helped me shift um, gears to not only being a founder, but also an investor. So that's a little bit of my story. Um, and uh, along the way, uh, this summer, uh, just met uh, Buki, uh, who I will, will pass it off now. She's our uh, summer associate and um, you know, badass unto herself. So I'll, I'll let her give her own intro. So thank you, Buki. No problem. Hi everyone. Um, I am. My name is Buki. I started off my career. I graduated from from Emory University from for undergrad. Um, I was a business major and I focused in finance. And then after that, I went into consulting. So I spent time doing traditional management um, and operations consulting at Deloitte. And then I spent a few years doing brand consulting at Ogilvy. 
um, after Ogilvy, I started at HBS. So I am in between my first and second year at Harvard Business School. Um, and I am mostly involved in like the startup and entrepreneurship world there. So I was part of the iLab Accelerate iLab Accelerator working on a business idea this past semester um, and also got connected to the Acumen Accelerator um, and my team is still working with the Acumen Accelerator now and I'm spending my summer with Sergio and the rest of the team at Rebel One and I'm really excited about today. Um, we just really want to showcase founders of color who are doing amazing work in these spaces so we're excited to hear you all pitch. Awesome. Um, in addition to the Rebel One team, we also have um, some guest investors on the phone. Um, our goal with all of this, by the way, is to just increase exposure and help to make some connections in this space. And so we, we really want all of you to engage with the investors on the phone. So I'll give them each um, a couple of minutes to just introduce themselves, um, say a little bit about their background and the work they're doing at their current firms. Um, we can start with Mario. Oh, great. Uh, well, first <laughs> off, thank you, Sergio, and thank you, Buki, for, for creating this platform. I think it's uh, particularly given where we are uh, in, in the world and in the country right now, it's an incredibly important platform to have. And I I'm, I'm really appreciate having the opportunity to speak to everyone on the video today. And kind of break back on myself. So Marguerite, I'm from originally out of Bronx, New York. I went to public school in New York um, all the way through high school, attended Baruch College in New York City for undergrad, and then started my career in investment banking at Barclays in New York and then worked for four years at a growth equity firm in New York focused on FinTech, and then decided to get my MBA at Yale, uh, where, where I recently graduated last year. And while I was at Yale, participated in Dorm Room Fund, which is a student-run organization helping to support uh, undergrad and graduate founders. And, and through Dorm Room Fund, started an initiative called the Blueprint Project, which um, has two tracks. One is a track to help um, underrepresented minority founders really think about ideation and think about finding their companies. Then also a new track that we're launching this summer to help aspiring UARM investors also to kind of have that same toolkit in order to break into venture. And kind of uh, on my day job today, I'm currently an investor at PayPal Ventures, where we're a, a corporate venture arm of PayPal, where we focus on series A to series C investments, you know, both here in the US, but also internationally. Thank you. Um, and then Luan. Awesome, thanks Buki, thanks Sergio for having us. Um, my name is Awam Kafella. I um, actually grew up in Nairobi, Kenya, which I, is where I am right now. So fun fact, it's a little after midnight in Nairobi. Um, <laughs> but happy that I have the opportunity to join you all. Uh, my background, I went to College of William & Mary um, where I studied finance and economics. After that, I spent some time at a FinTech startup and then spent a few years doing um, private equity with focus on emerging markets. Currently, I work in early stage investing at Village Capital, and we are focused on investing in impact ventures uh, that are for profit in the US and emerging markets. Thanks. And the mom is amazing. I didn't even realize she was still in Kenya because when I reached out to her and I told her about this event, I told her about what we were trying to do with everything that's going on right now. She was like, I don't care what the time is, I'll make it work. Um, and it's midnight, so she really meant that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then Edwin. Hey guys, Sergio Buki. Thanks for putting this on. Thanks for having me. Um, my name is Edwin Laredo. Uh, a bit of background, graduated from Princeton University, focused on economics and finance, then went into banking out in New York for a few years with the focus around fintech and then kind of fell into just capital raising. Um, now with Core Innovation Capital, which is a fintech and sure tech focused fund out of San Francisco and LA. And we invest in businesses that help democratize prosperity. So really anything that helps people save money, save time, create upward mobility. Um, we are primarily a seed Series A fund, but check sizes really range from 250K up to like that 7 million mark. Um, yeah, pretty much it. Thanks for having me, guys. Great. Thank you. And then Kaiten. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Kaiten. I work at Impact America Fund. We are focused on investing for a future where people of color experience sort of true agency and participation in the American economy. I came to this work a little bit circuitously. I grew up in Jamaica and got into startups in the mid 90s when they were a thing. Um, then I moved to the US to get an engineering degree and I moved to California after to work in Silicon Valley engineering for a decade or so. And then after my engineering career, I got into research and got a PhD focused on the overlap between 
technology development and marginalized populations and how technology was or wasn't being developed for those communities or from those communities. And I got into venture capital as a way to sort of make an intervention in the way capital was deployed to, those, to solve those problems. And at Impact America, I held direct research and investment strategy towards that end. Great, thank you so much. Um, so now we will now we will kick it over to the to founders to start pitching. Um, as we mentioned before, when we were giving you guys all the background information, we really want the the timing to stick to six minutes. Um, we think that's enough time for you guys to, to convey the ideas. And we don't want this conversation to stop here. So don't feel like you have to get everything out um, in this conversation. We're happy to make connections afterwards so that people can keep, keep speaking and keep working together. Um, so we will start off with Calvin at Freeman Capital. All right, let me get the sharing of the screen going and I will go full screen here. Are you able to see this? Yep, we can no? see it. All right, perfect. Yep. All right, I'll start my six minutes. All right, great. All right, go. My name is Calvin Williams, the founder of Freeman Capital. And what we are doing is that we are providing wealth management as a subscription service that is specifically providing wealth building actions. So diving in, you all know about the, the wealth gap because there's a lot of FinTech folk here. So I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time, but we have a negative trend in which both black and Latinx wealth are trending to zero within the next 50 years. When you peel back a layer there, you will kind of see that part of the problem is building wealth. The other part of the problem is keeping and passing it on. And so when you look at how wealth is passing from one generation to a next, in terms of people of color, this is just black. It's really not, not happening with or without an, without an a inheritance. We're talking about very small funds here. So we have a tale of two problems. People often lump us in with like these other investment firms, but the problem that these firms are solving is how, how do you invest and do it for cheap or free? The problem that we are solving is how do you build generational wealth? The mindset and the framing is very, very different because we look at that historic problem that I just mentioned. And so for us, it comes down to a couple things that, uh, that, uh, that, that we do, which is very different. The first that we assess where people are with what, uh, with, 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 uh, with what we call wealth foundations. We then help them improve their financial behaviors and then increase their financial successes. We do this all while providing high touch financial planning for all users, not just those who are wealthy or, or who have hundreds of dollars to pay per hour. We help summarize this whole wealth building process with a score that is normalized from one to 100. Uh, and so that is what makes it very, you know, very, very different in this space. When you look at, you know, how we do it, it really does come down to that foundations. Then we look at our behaviors and our successes. So an example of that is Sarah, is someone who is, who, you know, first came to us. We have 45 different criteria of building wealth between success, behavior, and foundations. And then each month, there's so much that she can do financially within our automated service. And then even with the human advisor as well, we can provide her the top three things she needs to focus on that month to help increase her net worth. And that is why we've been so successful. That, that when you look at our users, 83% of them have experienced a positive net worth increase within their first year. 70% of them have gone on to build and uh, have a debt payoff plan, as well as um, a, um, a, uh, a budget, as well as a really, really key, key, key point that I'm very proud of. Almost a third of our active users have built up three months of savings versus 70% of the US population who has no savings whatsoever. And so we are seeing that the, uh, that the data coming out of our paid policy is working and people are growing and building their wealth. For us, the opportunity is in diversity because as we all know that the majority of the country is trending non-white. And when you look at the focus on niche players of people of color, there, are, there are really is none there. And so for us, we start off with the academy, which is free. We provide financial planning, investment management, and then what we call wealth concierge, which is the management and preservation of wealth, all for virtually the price of Netflix. So our go-to-market strategy includes from the B to C side, we do organic growth, content marketing, where the bulk of our leads have come. We are running some paid ads, but what we're really excited about is our B to B to see channels, which we are able to white label our solution, which is going to, uh, 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 which, which, which will let us grow uh, exponentially for you know, our user growth. 
the way that we make money is through uh, our financial planning, which is our core monthly service, which varies from 15 bucks to about 97 per um, per per uh, per per month. The investment management is basically a loss leader for us, but we could charge fees. And because we charge insurance premiums as well, that's another uh, bit of uh, revenue for us. When you look at our key traction, we uh, just really launched publicly uh, just in the first quarter of last year. Our paid user costs around $17 for customer acquisition with the annual customer revenue being just over 333 bucks. We, we have built up a wait list and a, um, and a membership community that's over 9,000 people. We just started to let them on board in terms of being free and paid of 200, but we are already uh, just 200 customers away from uh, getting to be a cash flow positive. So we are, so we have proven that the unit economics work and we are scaling up from there now as we put our marketing plan in kind of in place. Uh, and when you look at our team, it's myself, a previous 40, under 40 winner, Bruce, who is our CFO, raised over $78 million for venture back firms in his career. Daryl, my, C, my uh, chief marketing, who's done marketing for big brands like Target and Haynes and big personalities like Kevin Hart and, of course, startups as well. When you look at our advisors, you have Barbara Bickham, who is our IT advisor, who has over eight successful exits. Mark Prunell, who has uh, built and exited three successful service businesses. And Matt Walyard, who is especially critical because he's a behavioral scientist and helps us to uh, nudge people's behavior to go down this path of building wealth. So in short, this is Freeman Capital. We are working to close the wealth gap. We are uh, currently um, accepting investments and we're open to have those conversations. And I think I did it with 15 seconds to spare. Great job. Great job, Calvin. <laughs> Great job. Thank you so much. Um, so now we will, we will open the floor to the investors. So feel free to chime in with any questions or thoughts or feedback. Um, and we'll give you guys up to, to four or five minutes or so to discuss. So this is Mario from PayPal Ventures. Uh, thank you, Calvin, for the time. I had a question around um, the advisor network and kind of scalability around there. Can you talk a little bit about kind of where are you sourcing these advisors and kind of, and also how, how do you, how do you think about scaling that over time as you grow your network? Yeah. So first in this current iteration of our service, it's more human uh, advisors than e e even before COVID it's, it was pretty easy for us to, to, to find uh, folks who are, you know, independent and working from home. And so it's basically a, it's a, it's a Uber model for the advisors um, and they come onto our platform and they, they are a Freeman uh, capital advisor. So we have oversight from a regulatory perspective, but we are mapping the um, conversations and the decision uh, logic between all of the recommendations because the end goal is to build out a AI to handle the more narrow and the more simple financial problems. And then just the uh, advisors would, uh, would be there for the more higher end, more complex questions and topics. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Calvin, bu building off of that a little bit, um, where, where do people typically start on that financial journey, right? On your target demo, what is exactly the first thing that you're helping them right off the bat? Is it around budgeting, kind of on the investing side? Here's to see where day one is for these, for the target demo. Yeah, so investing is normally the hook for folks because they think that investing is the way of building wealth. But, but then once we have them through that part, then it really is figuring out how to handle their debts and to position their cash flow uh, and their retirement to put them in a position to build wealth. And in, your, in terms of your target demo, what do you think is the initial and the lasting sort of competitive advantage for you from their point of view between you and the other players in this space? So it's not just because of George Floyd, but we've always had a big interest in people that wanted to use a firm that uh, embraced their values and their culture. And I think that the larger firms, they are kind of, I don't want to say morally bankrupt, but I mean, it's you know hard for them to stand on grounds of, you know, inclusivity when even just as recent as December, there was a big brain that turned away a customer because he, he was too big and too black. And so I, so I, I, I think that this new um, American majority is, is trying to find firms that you know, embrace them. And plus our cost 
financial structure, our business models where it's month to month, um, and the way that we focus on taking them from step one of where they are to, to building wealth are all reasons why they choose us. Thank you. Could you, hey Calvin, could you explain a little bit more about the price differential that we saw on the screen? I think it was $15 to $97. Yeah, so we are still experimenting with the pricing, so it's not like solidified, but we have we have seen that the lower end, which is the $15 to $20 range, folks are fully fine and uh, in like a fully automated solution there where they're just getting that type of recommendation. But then in terms of the um, getting one-on-one -on -one monthly uh, certified financial planners. We're playing with that range now. We have seen that, that they're comfortable with as high as 97 uh, and we're currently charging six, uh, 65 bucks. So we aren't exactly sure where we're gonna do, but, but we know it's gonna be a high and a low. We The folks that we're really disrupting are the traditional financial planners. So we're just trying to figure out what is that right number that helps us to fully disrupt that market, but then you know it still keeps us profitable and growing. I'm not sure if we have time for one more, uh, for another question, but um, I think on the, one of the pages you had, it was like $334 for in revenue for a customer per year. Maybe mm -hmm. talk a bit about how that looks, uh, looks relative to like wealth creation over the year for a typical customer. I am sorry, you broke up like right in the middle, and then I. I oh, sorry. So you, you, I think $334 was the revenue per customer per year. Yep. If you could talk a little bit about how, how is that relative to the wealth creation for that customer or an average customer over a year. That's that's a, a good question, and I could BS you a answer, and I don't and I don't have I don't have one now. But if you let me just look at the metrics, and I'm happy to follow up and tell you what that is in terms of average. I just don't know it off the top of my head. Okay, yeah, I'm happy to also follow up offline as well. Yeah, but I can get you that that though. Thanks. Great. Okay. Thank you so much, Calvin. And thank you everyone for the questions. Um, like we said, we want these conversations to keep going afterwards. So we are going to move on to Lifted. I'll start the clock once you hit present. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. All righty, let me share here. Uh, it's got me disabled from sharing. Oh, there we go. Yep. There you go, your time. All right. Fantastic. Um, hi, my name is Andrew. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Lifted, and we are equipping school teams and families with tools to close the achievement gap for the one in five students who learn differently. So this is Haroon. Uh, I met him a few years ago. He has autism and he's age six, but he's learning at about a one-year-old's level. He's one of seven and a half million students with a wide variety of learning disabilities. And the majority of them actually have average or above average IQ. Yet every year they score well below national math and reading proficiency levels. It's not because they're less intelligent, it's rather that their educators lack quality tools to address their unique needs. And as a result, schools spend a little over $5 billion a year on special education legal disputes that are raised by parents, rightfully so. It's why we created Lifted. We are making it easy for um, teachers, specialists, therapists, uh, and families to confidently address the needs of students with learning disabilities. Um, they save time individualizing instruction, it fosters collaboration across the school team, and it actually improves instruction and supports using data that Lifted produces. So when COVID-19 caused school closures in March, it exacerbated vulnerabilities for students with moderate to severe learning disabilities. They can't just sit in front of a Zoom session and receive instruction independently. So parents who now have to become pseudo instructors have and continue to struggle to support these learners who can't receive this independent um, online instruction or e-therapy. For us, Lifted became a tailwind, um, increasing our usage 3x. The move to distance learning um, also increased demand for Lifted for our demo request uh, a little over 500%. And school directors like Jared have praised our ability to support um, them and their staff in these uncharted waters. We responded pretty quickly and we developed a new module within our platform called Lift Lifted for Families um, to reach and engage parents using two-way secure SMS-based communication. Uh, it allows the educators to send, first of all, messages to keep in contact with parents. Um, they can share instructional support materials like PDF files, video recordings in order to prepare for instruction. It's HIPAA and FERPA compliant. 
um, produces real-time language translation. So we get around barriers like um, for families where English is a second language and it does things like health and wellness surveys. It also allowed us to introduce a new B to E to B model, which is um, us selling to educators who then advocate up and help us sell to the school district. To date, we've used the prepaid annual sales um, SAS model. It's B to B selling directly to school districts. We have software, um, a few different tiers that starts at 449 per user and allows up to 20 students all the way up to a little over a thousand per user. We also provide professional services. In special education, you can't just sell pure services or pure software, you need to bundle on services that we can um, offer virtually. And those range from $1,500 to over 5K. And um, our district sales on average, our contract values are about 21K, but today we have them ranging from as little as five all the way up to a little over 100,000. Educators truly love Lifted. A couple of use cases I'll highlight. Um, the Arizona School for the Blind, they are a national thought leader in the space. They went from a 5K pilot to 120K contract in three months. They scaled up from 40 students to 450 from one site to um, over 35 school districts, 86 schools, and a little over 100 homes. And they're now leveraging Lifted to spread the message across all um, schools and, and districts in the country that support blind and visually impaired learners. Um, the Parsippany Troy Hills School District out in New Jersey, one of our pioneering customers, a similar land and expand strategy, contract value is about 60K. They scaled up from 15 to 200 staff, from 20 to 250 students over the course of about two years. Um, so once we get in and, and secure territory, um, it becomes a lock-in effect that uh, users rarely churn. We've also shown through a, a pilot study with WestEd, one of the leading research um, education advocacy firms in the country, that we can save up to nine hours a week per special education teacher. 100% um, of paraprofessionals reported a higher perception of their, their teaching efficacy. A paraprofessional is a teaching aid, so they feel like they can actually deliver better instruction with Lifted and 85% of users feel like they can better align students' individualized learning plans with um, what they're doing on a daily basis in the classroom. We are absolutely poised to scale up. Um, we did about $300,000 in annual revenue this past school year, and we have a path to a million despite school closures and COVID. Um, we did it from 14 contracts, which spanned over 130 schools in four states. And our path to a million in ARR works through um, our referral network, um, this B to, B to E to B, conversion that I mentioned, and then selling directly to school districts um, as well as at, at the county level. A little bit about our market. Um, it is a $8.3 billion ed tech K-12 market. And we drill down and, and focus on special education solutions. We're at nearly 600 million and we're supporting today the seven and a half million kiddos that have a diagnosed learning disability. I'm going into the future tomorrow. We expand into international markets. Um, we're currently in Denmark already. We're absolutely the team to do it. My co-founder, Joanne, has her doctorate in special education and behavior analysis. I'm a past um, user experience designer and technology consultant, also a Forbes 30 under 30 in education. Brian has led technology teams for 22 years and, and Heather handles all of our post-sales implementations. Got a path to 50 million in revenue and because of time I'll end here. We're raising 1.3 million and we are nearly at 700K committed. Love to tell you about it afterwards if you're interested. Thank you. Great job, Andrew. <laughs> Glad, Bookie. Okay, um, I'll just go ahead and open it up to, to all the investors. Feel, feel free to jump in with your questions. Hey, thanks, Andrew. Um, first thing, oh, what schools are you targeting? Uh, just curious how it relates to affordability, budgeting limits, um, and then also can you speak to the outcomes for the student in terms of the kind of impact that you're seeing on test results or other key metrics? Yeah, absolutely. So we sell primarily to public school districts, um, but also to charter schools and what we call non-public schools, which are um, alternative institutions when a, a student can't be served in a public setting because of um, the, the amount of services or support that they need, then they will uh, go to an alternative school that the public district pays for. Uh, so that, that's the target market and we are split 50-50 right now, 50% public districts, 50% alternative. Um, in terms of price points, we are uh, that what you saw on the screen, the, the 449 works out to be around 30 to $40 per student per year. And our funding comes from um, a federal source, the Individuals with um, Disabilities Act, IDEA. Um, so 
to date, we haven't had any concerns around our, our price points. Actually, um, spending in special education is two to three X that of, of um, general ed. Um, so we're within the, the realm of, of, uh, of EdTech products, um, but we are introducing a new equity access model. It's actually an article that's going on in EdSurge this week where we're offering a, a new, even lower price point for Title I lower income schools. And then, sorry, the, the question about the um, efficacy. So we've run a study with um, WestEd in the past where we can show that uh, students with learning disabilities, they can increase the rate that they're mastering their individualized learning goals up to 30%. Um, these are legally mandated learning goals um, that are tied back to state standards. Uh, we're running another study right now with another company called um, uh, WeStat, very similar, and it's gonna be a, um, a controlled pilot. So we're, we're taking that efficacy and hoping to, to show a, a much larger sample size. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about uh, the implementation and particularly the training part for powerful professionals. So how do they get up to speed on the product and how do they kind of teach other paraprofessionals as, as that, um, you know, leave and, and new ones come in and how does that continue to work? Yeah, so um, PD, what they call it in schools, professional development is, is huge. It's $17 billion market. So um, when special ed directors buy lifted, they absolutely expect the, the training component and they have professional development days that are typically at the beginning of the school year. So we look at a school's PD calendar and we fit into one of those days. Um, Pre-COVID, that meant an on-site training, which could be either half day, four hours, or full day, eight hours, depending on the scale. And that would be for the entire staff that's using Lifted. So we have training modules. Um, it takes usually two staff trainers, and we break them up. So like teachers, therapists, paraprofessionals, they go through modules throughout the day. Um, and then we give them a toolkit afterwards, which is all online, called Lifted Academy, to basically um, turnkey it as they bring on new, new staff members throughout the year. Um, now let's become virtual. So we had a training last Friday with um, 50 staff members online, all through Zoom and Kahoot, or you can raise hands and have private chats. Um, so we've now taken that model virtual, we've done that in the past, and um, similar follow through uh, in terms of what happens afterwards. The only difference is the price point is lower. So we charge basically half of what we would for an in-person. Thank you. Okay, we have time for one more question. Uh, Andrew, you, you mentioned um, a few different growth vectors, but you spent a bit of time talking about land and expand. And I wonder if you could just provide a little bit more detail on what are some of the accelerants to sort of the land and expand, or, or what things are sort of obstacles or slowing down that sort of growth mechanism. Yes. Um, so the the accelerants to this land and expand is. Um, basically this, this cohort model, this cohort referral model. Uh, for example, in, in New Jersey, we're a part of the largest school districts um, in, in northern New Jersey. It's called Morris County, it's 30 of them. And uh, once we land and expand in one, special ed directors tend to talk about lifted and they do this at monthly administrator meetings. So the way that we grow is, is actually not through selling to those districts one-to-one, -one. it's getting a foothold in a, in a handful of them and then leveraging the referral network to actually grow. Um, in terms of actual like new adoption, when we get into new states and new locations, a land and expand model basically means that uh, a director will, will purchase lift to determine which grade levels or which disability groups is it's most plausible for in the first year, like the ones that are most apt to, to, to taking on something new. And then um, the, the pace at which they expand is, is kind of uh, based on a number of factors. I can get into that with you on a separate conversation, but there's a, a few different metrics that we look at in regards to activation, um, retention, things of that matter, to see how quickly we can get them on board. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Andrew. That was great. Um, so we will. I will pass it over now to Florence um, to take us through Meet Caregivers. You're on mute, Florence. <laughs> Can you hear me now okay? Yes, now we can. Okay, sounds great. All right, six minutes starts. Great, uh, so hi everyone. So my name is Florence and I'm the founder and CEO of Meet Caregivers. So at Meet Caregivers, we are building the world's largest online marketplace for senior care. Her goal is to really to make it easier for seniors to have access to any resources 
such as technology tools, services, or products that they need so that they can happily continue to age at home as long as possible. As you all know, the population is getting older. 10,000 Americans are turning 65 every day. So by 2025, the US will have about uh, 17 million seniors and actually worldwide, we're gonna have over 1 billion. What's very interesting is the fact that 90% of seniors wants to age at home and they really don't wanna be moving to nursing home or assistant living facility. But unfortunately, the family and themselves, they're overwhelmed, they're stressed. They don't know where to go to find resources that they need so that they can continue to age at home. So meet caregivers, her goal is to really to, to focus on that and, and provide easy access to any type of resources seniors need. I personally witnessed this issue when I was working as a caregiver myself during my college years. One of the main prop issue uh, uh, that meet caregiver actually started with is really utilizing technology so that we can make in-home care more efficient and more, better quality for seniors. So her matching system that we build really enables seniors to be matched with the right caregivers that really not only have the skills to care for them, but also have the personality um, to get along with them for a long period of time, really just reduce the turnover that constantly happen in current home, home care um, industry. After the matching, we build a tracking tools that enable the entire care team member to track, coordinate the care so that the, the, the children who most of, most of the time live away from the family, from the, the, the love, the, the aging parents can really stay involved with what's happening. Um, and in case of an emergency, they quickly be notified and notify doctors if needed. And then uh, during uh, what, when we were building with caregivers, we talked to most mid, uh, seniors and, and their family members and asked them what type of specific resources that you need to access that you're struggling with. So those are specific uh, 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 lists that they gave us, um, such as they need access to meal delivery, case management, transportation. They're struggling to figure out how they're going to get the medication. And even uh, during COVID, of course, many of them needed telehealth. Uh, some of the product that they listed are depends, workers, and their family member told us that they need some specific technology tools to enable them to easily track and coordinate care, automatic payments, and even an automatic reimbursement system so that they know actually when they're looking for care, how much an insurance can pay and how much they have to pay by themselves, which can really be a very difficult process and overwhelming uh, for many seniors and their families. Meet caregiver business model is pretty easy. Currently, we're taking 30% commission uh, for every transaction, services or product or any tools. We are looking to open up a platform to also other healthcare organization or even corporation um, who will, can utilize a platform um, for their members, for their employees, or, or even for maybe the partners as well. Her traction to date last year, Meet Caregiver did about uh, 1.1 million gross revenue. Um, our last May in, uh, uh, revenue uh, was 185, which is about 100% growth since COVID. So during COVID, Meet Caregivers has been really growing rapidly uh, due to the fact that we basically launched different services and products through a platform to support the communities. Some of the products include free meal delivery. We partner with local food bank pantries so that we can provide access to foods to seniors who were struggling uh, to uh, were afraid to go outside. Um, and then we launched the shopping and around for some seniors. We even started to also coordinate PPE to our caregivers, to seniors and to local healthcare organization that was struggling to access uh, those very important PPE. And we also opened a platform so that senior community around the area can actually utilize a network of caregivers so that they can staff their own residents because during COVID the struggle, many of the, their staff were very afraid to care for the residents and, and they needed support on that. So all of those efforts during COVID enabled us to grow over 100%. Um, a quick competitive advantages, as, as you can see, Meet Caregivers is really the only platform that have a proprietary matching system that provide access to seniors to caregivers, products, tools, and nobody else uh, is doing that currently. Of course, our EPA compliance coordination system that we currently build and we will continue 
um, to differentiate ourselves from any other competitors. We have an amazing team with ext extensive experience in digital healthcare, but also in in-home care. I personally have over 10 plus years experience working as a caregiver. Um, her CTO, Charlie Berg, has over 20 plus years experience. He has exited multiple um, organization, digital uh, healthcare organization in the most in the in the Massachusetts area, and of course our other team members that also bring extensive experience in business development um, and digital healthcare. We are quickly looking to raise two million dollars convertible note. We're doing 20% discount so that we can continue to grow and scale rapidly. Um, how the, the $2 million will go towards continue to strengthen our technology, uh, uh, bring on board more uh, sales and partnership so that we can continue to increase partnership with other healthcare organizations. A quick look at our financial for the next few years. The $2 million that we're looking to raise will get us from $200,000 per month to over a million dollars. Thank you. Thank you, Florence. Great job. Perfect. Just in time. Okay, so we can go ahead and open it up now. Hey, Florence. Um, Hi. Thanks so much for your time. I was curious, so what does the screening process and then like the quality control or quality assurance process looks like for the caregivers? That's great. Um, so when the caregivers apply through a platform, they go through a very uh, extensive screening process where we check the background check, uh, reference check. They have to take a test to really make sure that they have the knowledge of providing care to seniors. Um, in a different, in addition to that, we also check uh, references and, and just make sure that they, they've previously worked with seniors, but also have um, good references as well. Uh, right now, less than 30% of caregivers that actually apply through a platform really make it uh, uh, through on it or, or to be added to a platform. Hey, Florence. Um, building off of that, how are you forcing the caregivers, right? This is becoming an increasingly hot space. More, more companies are entering. How are you getting access to the top tier caregivers in a particular area? Um, great question. Um, so around Massachusetts, that's where we, we are based right now. Uh, we form partnership uh, with local training centers such as Ray Cross and other um, uh, uh, pro, uh, schools that uh, basically train caregivers um, to become certified nursing assistant and really uh, learn how to be a, a great caregivers. We also partner with local um, university uh, nursing school. Uh, many of them do want the future nurses or doctors to start or really getting um, experience uh, on the field as fast as possible. Uh, so we've been partnering with them as well. Um, and of course, many of the caregivers are finding us online and then go ahead and apply. Uh, one of the main differentiators that meet caregivers has as well is the fact that we really do want to make sure that our caregivers are well treated. Uh, and we very, we very much value them. And we do pay our caregivers more than um, or at least um, the traditional home care agency, for example, in terms of number uh, on average in Massachusetts, the caregivers are getting about $12 an hour when meet caregiver is paying minimum of $15 an hour and her matching uh, platform is not just focusing on matching the seniors with the right caregivers, but also really making sure that we're matching the caregivers with a senior that they feel like they have the right skills and personality and criteria to care for them so that they can also have a high satisfaction rate uh, of taking care of the seniors. So all of that together really enable us to have um, a, a high satisfaction rate, rate with not only the seniors, the family, but also with our caregivers. Great, we have time for one more quick question. Hi Florence, I have a quick question. Um, you mentioned geographical expansion. I don't know if you could talk a little bit uh, about the challenges, if any, in managing the sort of variation in state-by-state -state compliance and regulation about uh, at-home care. Yeah, so you're breaking up a little bit. I think uh, you, want, you want me to talk about the geographical expansion. Um, so Meet Caregiver is looking to expand rapidly nationwide. Um, so with the $2 million, uh, investment that we're getting, her goal by the end of this year to basically have the, the tools and the, the products already available nationwide. In terms of the caregiving side, we have to enter uh, geographically. Um, her next stop is in New York, um, Connecticut, and even looking at California. 
um, as well. Um, in terms of scalability, we really uh, want to rely on our automation to enable us to to, uh, to, to, uh, to rapidly um, enter those markets. Um, when we enter each market, it's very important to meet caregivers to understand, the, of course, the law, the, uh, mm -hmm. the law, for example, in each geographic market. Uh, meet caregiver, uh, really, you know, we, we make sure that we follow uh, the requirements in each state. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much, Florence. Okay, now we will kick it over to Jacob for Uptrust. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, good. Great. Perfect. Hi, I'm Jacob Sills. I'm one of the co-founders of Uptrust. So the human caging and supervision burdens we place on millions of Americans each year ruin lives and are incredibly wasteful. You know, outrageous fines and fees, the fact that people have to pay bail bonds to get their own freedom. Um, the whole system sucks and people are getting screwed. And so for 70 million people with a criminal record, small mistakes, little issues lead to these massively bad outcomes that ruin lives, but also, you know, also screw with local governments and a lot of corporations that work with them. So in trying to tackle this large, seemingly intractable problem, where we focused first was on technical violations. And what technical violations are is over a million people each year are incarcerated, not for an actual criminal offense, but for missing a court date or a probation check-in. This is disproportionately affecting people of color and costs local governments $10 billion a year. And when we spoke to people, the issues of why people were missing court were not like fleeing, you know, the country like on episodes of Law and Order, but it was simply issues like, you know, I didn't have a right to court or, you know, I forgot that I had court. And so, you know, one of the things when we looked at, you know, how would you solve this problem is we built software that would simply just connect people to their public defender or probation officer via their phone. You know, we had this view that people are inherently good. And if you inform them of their obligations and made sure they felt, you know, they were supported and the system was more humane, um, they would attend. And so uh, we started this a few years ago and it worked out. Um, sorry, let me just, oh, um, you know, we had about a 50% improvement in court appearance rates, um, which allowed us to go pretty quickly. Um, we now have over 400 counties under contract, um, reducing court dates by 50%, which has resulted in millions of savings, as well as, you know, thousands of people who have not been put in jail or prison due to these technical violations. We've also seen that, you know, growth has expanded massively since COVID. You know, we've, we've worked with about 200,000 people over the last year and are now under contract, have about a run rate of 900,000 people. So our goal was to get to a million of uh, people served by the end of the year, and we're gonna blow past that. In terms of the criminal justice system, you know, COVID's had this massive effect because people aren't going to court as much. There's a lot more um, sort of understanding and acceptance and adoption of sort of technology, which also creates a lot of problems that we need to steer clear of. Um, notably, if you look at sort of the market and how people have tried to address alternatives to incarceration, it's generally through ankle monitors and smart apps that might geolocate. Now that's a problem because that's a continual expansion of the prison industrial complex. So how we're thinking about the market and how we price it is a much lower cost per user. The idea is to make it up in scale and to build sort of a trusted position where we're working with governments and helping them save money and also helping people navigate this complicated place uh, system. Um, what's also really critical here as it relates to how we've approached it is we do not allow any costs to pay, pass down to the end user. Uh, the biggest issue in the criminal justice system with ankle monitors and these smart apps is they price so high and the governments pass them down and therefore they're just perpetuating the problem in inequities. So when looking at sort of the competitive landscape, this is where the opportunity lies. And where it lies is that everyone who's been working in this space as a for-profit company, and there are some big companies, have really just focused on business models that leech off of the backs of low-income Americans. Um, outrageous fees. These ankle monitors cost like 10 bucks a day in many places. They're geolocating people and surveilling them. And so, you know, the users don't have any trust in them. So these companies can only make money off of users for a short period of time. There's no built relationship with the massive amount of people that have been interacting with the justice system. 
And if you think about the current you know, zeitgeist for reform, these companies are gonna get hurt. So how we look at the problem is not just delivering savings and helping people navigate, but think about the large number of people with a criminal record and how we can support them in other areas of their lives. What's really important here is that the same people that unfortunately are being arrested are often, you know, have been on Medicaid or they might be using sort of the wrong type of banking product and they're using payday lenders and check cashing facilities. And by building a relationship, by not geolocating them, by not charging them money, by focusing on their support, we're starting to build a relationship with a very large underserved demographic. So what that looks like for Uptrust and how we're gonna become a giant business is we can help people attend their probation check-ins and drug tests as we're doing now and keep them out of jail. But when they're coming out of jail or prison for 30 days, they might've been taken off of Medicaid. We can help sign them back up. For the probation, they might be unemployed and need to find job. We can have partnerships with Walmart and keep them you know, uh, finding better jobs and supporting them there. And if you think about financial services, you know, there are a ton of banks that now don't charge fees and there's an ability there to actually play matchmaker. And where that's really important and how we differentiate ourselves is once again, not burning our customer, but thinking about their long-term health and value. So that means Wells Fargo might pay us more money to sign up a checking account. But if Chime's charging no fees and we don't have to worry about overdraft fees, that's a place that's gonna actually help the well-being of the tens of millions of people that interact with the justice system. So for us, while the criminal justice system is, is sort of our entry point and allows us to operate at a negative customer acquisition cost, there's actually all these areas, whether it's financial services, lead generation, connecting people to Medicaid facilities, helping them you know, make appointments with their primary care doctor or help people who are unemployed find jobs. Thank you, Jacob. I just want to be fair to everyone. Give everyone a good amount of, same amount of time. So. That, was, that was the last slide anyway. <laughs> oh, that could be the first question. Tell us about your team. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so it's myself, Eli, who's the CTO. We are the co-founders. Um, and then Matthew joined. We have a team of, of eight people, um, about half software engineers, and myself, who does sort of sales and partnerships. Cool. Thanks, Jacob. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about go-to-market. I'd imagine these um, municipalities are pretty hard to get a hold of and also to convince. Maybe you could talk a little bit more just about go-to-market strategy and how you're acquiring these municipalities. Sure. And so um, public defenders haven't really been sold technology before. So initially when we started a little, you know, a little bit ago, this was sort of something new. Um, but now once we had such good results, uh, people are now reaching out to us. So it's really not that difficult to get people to take our calls because usually through word of mouth or advisors, we can get in touch with any public defender or probation chief pretty easily. Thanks, Jacob. Can you talk a little bit on, on the flip side of that, right? So they probably put you in touch with the ultimate end user and how, what that process is like in terms of getting a hold of them, whether it's like downloading an app or it's done via SMS and, and just kind of that lowering that friction for them to utilize the product. Sure. And so for us, it's, it's really sinking in with a process flow that already exists, which is public defenders or probation officers have asked people for their phones and are usually meeting them briefly. Um, and what we do is either through SMS or downloading of an app um, or saying, hey, here's my number. Uh, we have an integration with their case management system. And it's a pretty simple, easy to stand up integration where we're getting, you know, batch files of people's um, phone numbers and court dates, publicly available information um, that allow us to facilitate sort of the communication and set up these conversations between public defenders and probation officers. And so um, that allows us to sort of collect this information and build those relationships without a lot of friction. You know, one of the challenges before was that if public defenders had enough time to call clients, uh, which a lot of them didn't, you know, they had a hundred something clients, so they had no way to do this. So they had this information, but they like, they just couldn't, you know, provide the outreach and the support that their clients needed. Thanks, Jacob. Um, where do things kind of stand today in terms of the municipalities that you've engaged with or where is your geographic footprint currently? Sure, so we're in, um, I think as of next month, 26 or 27 different states reaching over 400 counties. 
um, about 16 of the 25 largest counties, such as like LA, five boroughs in New York. Um, and how we've approached that is focusing on large counties because that gives us through one integration, a much larger footprint, but also in the criminal justice system, there's a lot of statewide systems. So we can do a single integration with like Georgia, Virginia, Maryland, um, Wisconsin, Iowa, Louisiana, or in Missouri, our current statewide systems. And they give us access to about 100,000 users per. Um, and so that's sort of where we focused on. So you don't have to do 400 integrations to reach 400 counties. It's actually closer to like 70. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much, Jacob. And thank you for the mm -hmm. questions. Um, we will, we're gonna move on now to our final pitch. Um, so I'll hand it over to Christian for coins. Christian, are you there? Yep, give me one second. I was not sharing my screen for some reason. There we go. There we go. Good? Yep, all set. Yep. Awesome. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Christian Zimmerman, co-founder and CEO of Coins. Uh, we help consumers, lenders and it's their consumers automate payments and, and uh, inc uh, increase payment retention. Um, so, as many of you know, with COVID-19 uh, recently happening, uh, we're seeing a lot of chargebacks starting to increase as well as uh, over $650 billion worth of delinquencies uh, for lenders and collection agencies. Uh, the reason being is there's just a lack, lack of flexibility for customers um, and offerings to make payments. It's either you pay it in full, pay a monthly minimum, or you can't pay anything at all. And typically there's just no flexibility of working, wanting to work with the customer, uh, which then builds a bad rapport with that lender. Um, and then uh, essentially that lend loan gets then sent off to uh, a collection agency. Um, so this is a huge missed opportunity for lenders to really recoup um, some of the lost uh, money that they're, they're losing from sending, sending uh, those money, those accounts, excuse me, to uh, uh, collection agencies and selling for pennies on a dollar. Um, uh, as you can see, there's about, uh, with regards to delinquencies and overall debt, there's a 14.3 trillion dollars in consumer debt nationwide. Um, when we specifically talk about um, uh, delinquencies, about 5.73 billion dollars, and we really plan on targeting, you know, late millennials, ages 25 to 34, all the way up to the 44 years old, um, that are uh, having issues with paying off debt. So it's about 150, 155 million dollars worth of market cap. So this is where we come in. Coins uh, is a mobile platform as well as a white label API that works with lenders um, to offer flexibility, uh, give them multiple ways to save throughout the month, increase payment retention so they can actually uh, make payments to the lenders. Um, and then obviously lower the cost. So not selling to a uh, collection agency that pennies on the dollar and actually recouping those payments um, throughout the month. So building a better uh, brand awareness for the customer and then building a better relationship with the customer as a whole. So how it would work is um, there's three steps to working with the lender. Uh, we start off with a simple, just uh, uh, brand integration. So we'll link the customer, the lender's uh, uh, account uh, to as a preferred lender within the app. Uh, the customer would then choose a financial goal. They would choose who they want to make a payment towards. All that would typically be automated. And then from there, the customer can select how they want to save throughout the month. And then essentially at the end of the month, we were facilitating the payments back to the lender uh, that we're working with. Um, with regards to the API flow, it's similar in, in the fact that uh, everything that's working on the front end for the consumer could also be in, integrated into a dashboard or a platform that, that the lender is already uh, offering to the customer. So if you have a login portal, we could actually just plug into like uh, a, a dashboard as well for that. So the team behind Coins is myself and my co-founder, Nate Washington. Um, both of us went and studied business management at Georgia State University. Uh, we're actually currently in the Google for Startups program, have also been through the Village Capital program, where, which uh, I know where I'm from. Um, Nate's actually a uh, three-time uh, founder, has started companies in the past, is also known as a state chess champion uh, here in Georgia. Um, so very methodical about how he thinks uh, he's also a CTO. And then with regards to compliance, we really want to make sure that we're obviously managing customer relationships as well as lender information very tight. So we were Joyce Mullen, who's our chief compliance officer, managing those relationships as well as regulation. 
To date, we've uh, paid off over $12 million nationwide for our customers uh, and the winners that we work with. We currently have two partnerships that are live and running. And on average, uh, right now we have 12,000 customers that are making payments, which on average save between $55 uh, every single month. Any given month, we're pushing $660,000 worth of transaction volume through our product. So we launched in January of 2017. Our first year we did 80,000. Last year, did, or second year, 200,000. Last year we did 320,000. Um, obviously with, with COVID, uh, we managed to change up uh, some of our uh, projections as well as um, our milestones of what we're, what we're going to focus on. So we do still plan on hitting at least half a million dollars for this year and then 1 million, over 1 million in, into 2021. So how do we make money? Um, so with the lenders that we work with, we actually just charge a monthly customer fee. So depending on how many customers that we want to work with, we charge a till our per customer fee. Um, and then from there on the back end, we actually charge a transactional payment fee for the payments that we're facilitating as well. Uh, that can range anywhere between five and 50%, depending on the volume that we're sending out, um, as well as uh, creating a monthly minimum that we work with the customer on an annual or six month contract. With regards to competitors, our model started out very similar to that of like Acorns Capital Digit, which is really primarily around you know, asset-based savings. Uh, we then kind of pivoted and focused around uh, not just debt reduction, but then working with lenders and uh, agencies themselves to help their customers uh, pay off debts faster. And that's kind of where we come into play now. So um, some new competitors are, would be like a true core that works solely on collection agencies, where we kind of tie in the technology as well as, as, well as working with lenders. Uh, we're currently looking to raise. Uh, we're, we're currently looking to raise uh, 2.1 million dollars, and we and we plan on using that money to uh, grow our team. Right now, our team's very lean. There's just uh, four of us total. We want to hire a couple more developers as well as BDR um, to really increase our pipeline for partnerships. And with that being said, I will open up the floor. I think I had about 20 seconds. I know I talk fast, so great job! Yeah, I love it. <laughs> Time is fair. Okay, so we'll open it up, <laughs> open it up now for questions. <laughs> Thanks, Christian. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about um, the uplift in collections you see for lenders using coins versus maybe just kind of traditional methods. Like, uh, what's the ROI for them? Yeah, so traditional lenders. So we, we have one pilot that's that we have fifty thousand customers that we're working with, and it went live uh, three weeks ago. Uh, with that specific lender, um, they were having about a one percent conversion rate on collections for uh, a specific payments that they were trying to collect on. Um, we're already seeing a two to 3% uh, right off the bat um, in, in, in uptakes from the payments that we're making for them. Um, and the reason being is a lot of the methods that they were using prior, which are primarily uh, agent calls, emails, and or uh, mailers. Mailers is a very popular way and form of, of trying to collect. Um, they have long URLs. We're coming in with simple technology, but that also works on the back end. So that information doesn't need to be input for the customer themselves. Um, and we're doing, you know, QR codes, uh, text to downloads, and then obviously the input that they uh, in, add in is already uh, input from our end for the lender because the information is already shared. Hey, Christian, um, quick question on the restructuring slash underwriting portion of this. Well, what kind of goes into that to determine whether a customer can really afford the new, newly structured payment plan? And then what role does the lender have in that process in terms of whether they're willing to take that on or not? So the typical customers that we're going to be working with are those that are uh, in delinquencies or at, at risk to, you know, falling collections agencies. We work with both ends. So if they're already in, in, been in collections, um, you know, it's in the collection's interest, to, uh, collection's interest to try to get it all up front because it doesn't typically work for the customer, uh, one of the things that we are able to add value is actually analyze their, uh, the customer's account. So when they link an account with coins, we can actually view the transaction deposits. From there, we're able to make a better decision as to how much, a better recommendation as to how much uh, they should be putting aside. So we're actually making that recommendation. The lender is not making that recommendation, recommendation at all. I will say one, one, one other thing though uh, around that um, is remembered was, uh, typically, uh, with regards to at-risk customers, um, they do want to recoup as much as possible. And so typical recuperation uh, uh, timelines is 7 to 12 months. We typically extend that because the payments are a little bit lower per month. But the value prop that we're showing is that by extending it longer, they are more willing to pay it back. Thanks. 
Okay, we have time for one more question. Okay. Um, I think- I took I think your advice you along. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate it, I appreciate it. Uh, okay, so I am, we, that takes us through all the pitches that we have. Thank you so much to all of the founders for pitching. I wish that we were in a room together so that we could all clap for you because you guys did oh. an amazing job. Um, but to wrap things up, it would be great to just get- um, we'll, I didn't we'll do that, we'll do the virtual clapping. Okay. <laughs> I know it's funny, but it feels it feels better, doesn't it? Doesn't it? a little bit? Yeah, we got a printer. We got all the electronics fit. Okay, great. So I didn't prepare them for this. I'm putting them on the spot. But for all of the guest investors, it would be great if you guys could just go through and give one final piece of like feedback um, to all of the the people that pitched today. We heard a bunch of really innovative um, ideas for how we can close some of the, the inequities that we see right now. So any final thoughts or feedback from the judges? I will open it up, and I won't cold call anyone. So please just, you know, volunteer and go in any order that, that you want. I can go. Um, I think one of the things I would amplify and a lot of the companies that participated today did a good job with this, but especially if you're a B2C company, really communicating what your B, uh, your distribution strategy is is super important and why it wouldn't be expensive for you to maintain and grow over time. Um, but I think everyone did a great job. Yeah, I think my, um, I think everyone did a great job. I echo that, uh, the sentiments. And I think, you know, maybe just one thing, I, in a couple of the presentations, we saw um, some information about unit economics and profitability. And I think um, that's something that investors will wanna know. So any way you could weave in not only just kind of revenue, but also gross profit, contribution margin, and thinking about what the longer term profitability would be is, is helpful. But I think everyone did a great job. I'll go next. Um, yeah, I think it, everyone did great. I think it's also, we're still adjusting to doing these Zoom pitches. Um, I think one thing is kind of going down on the differentiator, I think around tech, right? Kind of uh, a lot of these versus automation versus what's human run. Um, but I think so touching on that and elaborating a bit more on that, but overall, I think everyone did. Yeah, I, I would underscore everyone said uh, it's been great. Um, I know everyone's trying to figure out how to pitch in these times. I think one thing that you hear a lot is that funding has sort of constricted, you know, in the context of COVID and these times, but I think there is actually quite a lot of funding available if you can present a growth plan, and a runway and a strategy that is fit to the times. And I think many of you did just that. I think continuing to do that is gonna be really important. Awesome. Well, thank. Uh, I'll I'll close it out here. Thank you, uh, Kaitin Luam, especially for staying up at, at such a late hour on the other side of the planet. Uh, it, you know, there's there's beauty in, in in some of what we do. So we're we're excited you're you're involved, Mario, Edwin. Uh, thank you very much um, to to the the investors that joined us today and and the entrepreneurs that are building um, great businesses. So um, we'll close out the night. Thank you all, and uh, you'll hear from us for we're gonna have another pitch night in about a month or so. So uh, thank you again for joining us and, um, and stay in touch. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for all your hard work. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you everyone. Great event.